Thanks for everyone co for coming along. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we introduce ourselves. I'm John MacDonald. I'm the um, late, well, I'm a suspended Labour MP for Hayes and Harlington. I'm sure that's only a temporary matter. So the chief whip might not think. Um, thanks for coming along. This is hosted on uh, on the basis of the Labour Friends of Irish Unity, um, and the obviously there's there's a momentous occasion at the moment with regard to Ireland and the election that's going on, but also well, this was planned before that that was announced on the basis of. Now the, um, there's the prospect of a real debate now about Irish unity following on from the Good Friday Agreement, the potential that there is for building support for a proper decision-making process. And for many of us, I suppose, the, the potential for realization of a dream. And one of the issues that we need to discuss is the role of the Irish diaspora in particular. We've always played a role in trying to influence and shape the debate and, and keeping ourselves fully informed of the debate and we'll have a, a role to play now in this next stage in the process of securing our Irish unity. So we thought we'd, we'd convene a meeting with a range of speakers and that'll be a, it's an informal open discussion questions and all the rest okay but it is focused a lot on where we go from here and what role we can play in this country in achieving the Irish unity okay. Um, our first speaker is is Liz Savile Roberts. I'll ask the speakers to introduce themselves because I always get it wrong anyway, to be honest. Liz has got to uh, head off to another meeting. She always has. She's a busy person. We've just come from the Justice Union's Parliamentary Group, which Liz is the chair. I never, ever thought I'd be the voice of the screws in Parliament, but there you are. You know? um, so I'll ask Liz to introduce herself as the first speaker. Well, thank, thank you very much, John. It's a sort of a role reversal here, isn't it? Um, yeah, my name is Liz Savile Roberts. Um, I am the Westminster Parliamentary Leader of Plaid Cymru, and I represent a constituency in North West Wales, um, from some of the hills of which I can actually see the Wicklow Mountains, of which it is irrefutable that Dublin is the nearest capital city <laughs> by a very, very long shot. And we have a, a long tradition, I won't, um, Give me half a chance and I will bore you about the historical connections, but I probably shouldn't indulge myself on that now. But what I wanted to speak to you really is, is the role of, of Plaid Cymru in this. I'll be very aware that many of you probably will not know all that much about Plaid Cymru and I won't hold that against you. We're actually almost 100 years old as a party. Next year is our centenary. And a party, historically, if we use different sorts of, ter of terminology, if you're talking about self-determination, self-government, through the spectrum of different sorts of words, abstract concepts, through to independence. That has been, that is the role that remains the primary um, role of, of Plaid Cymru. And in that respect, um, we are, regard ourselves on the one hand as being allies of the Irish, uniting the Irish nation. It's, it, we are natural allies to that cause. And we're also very much drawing inspiration from what happens in Ireland. We're very interested in the fact that what happens in Ireland, what happens in Scotland, plays through to the confidence that people have with the independence, the Welsh independence agenda, which the Yes Cymru, which is the, the non-party political um, campaigning group for independence in Wales, has just had a salvation poll published today which shows 37% of adults supportive, a group of 2,000 people supportive, and very much so amongst younger people, people between 25 and 34, 63% of those people who responded now supportive of, of, of Welsh independence. Um, and in that respect, therefore, the work that we do here as parliamentarians, um, we have four MPs, that in, a, you know, in a, 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 the number of MPs who are returned from Wales fell from 40 to 32 that time round. So that number, and they are all of the constituencies that face the Western Seaboard as well. So our role here as parliamentarians, alongside that broad idea of, and the broad tradition of support, of seeking inspiration, is what we can do here as parliamentarians. We, we tread a slightly careful line in that we do not aim, we believe as a matter of principle that we do not interfere 
with the matters of the other nations when they come to a vote here. But nonetheless, I would regard us, and I would hope that you would consider us very much as natural allies. We talk particularly with, with Sinn Féin. We have had members from Sinn Féin have been present in our conferences. Um, I think we've had somebody over to your conference as well. And the, the sense of what happens in Ireland matters very much to what happens for us in Wales. And I think that I would like just to leave really my contribution before we take perhaps questions or I listen to other people before I have to go, is as natural allies, what we can be doing here is really of interest to me. Um, because it will reflect so much, there's almost, if you like, that selfish or the whale-specific interest, because I know it will be advantageous to us, it will bounce back to us in an advantageous way. But that fundamental questioning of the structuring of the United Kingdom and how it operates within the other nations, Ireland is a separate nation, Wales in future is a separate nation, Scotland is a separate nation, how we operate in mutual respect, and, and the, the small and the large steps that we take in that direction, and to echo, of course, what John has just said, that we need to bear in mind that we are standing at the potential of a great change now. For those of us who came as parliamentarians in 2015, it's almost incredible to believe that this change can come. But we do need to be imagining and shaping in our imagination the future that can be, because otherwise we are just always content with the tiny steps and the tiny issues. But that role within Plaid Cymru to support our allies in Ireland in that <coughs> common vision, that common respect and an ambition for the future, I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people have to say and that with our role here in supporting you. So, Diachan Barriam, Goramila Mahake. Thanks for your support, Liz, as always. Right, our next speaker is Diana Hughes, as the Newly elected Sinn Féin member of Parliament. Yeah, I'm still very much getting used to that. Um, J.D. Vokarja, uh, August Falcha. Thank you very much to Liberal Friends of Irish Indy for inviting me uh, and Sinn Féin to participate in this timely event. Uh, my name is Dara Hughes and I'm the Sinn Féin MP for Newry and Armagh, which is a border constituency in the north of Ireland. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say without any sense of exaggeration that the discussion on Ireland's constitutional future is at an excitingly high level. We're seeing an almost daily intervention on the subject of Irish unity from a variety of backgrounds as the debate and the discussion grows. People are actively considering what constitutional future is in their interests and people are examining now more than ever the economic, social and cultural potential of Irish reunification. Community leaders, academics, trade unionists, economists, journalists and business leaders are investing countless hours and huge effort into determining their preferences for our future. Uh, and a number of factors have contributed to this uh, surge in the Irish unity debate. Uh, Britain's decision to leave the European Union has injected a new impetus into the debate. Whilst we could all share criticism of the political trajectory of the European Union, not least in its recent wholesale departure as a supranational institution for peace. The conduct and outworkings of the Brexit process have greatly scarred the north of Ireland. The loss in revenue and economic potential is matched by the very real sense that opportunities are lost for future generations and that the protections of international human, social and economic rights frameworks have been or could be eroded. The North voted to remain in the European Union and that vote was a cross-community vote, recognising the constructive role that the EU had played in our peace process and in mitigating some of the worst excesses of partition with commonality on several All-Ireland issues. There is a cohort of political opinion in the North that values its European identity. These people may not necessarily support Irish unity, uh, but it will not be lost on them that the only route back to membership of the European Union is through Irish reunification. Uh, the April 2017 European Council statement was a significant intervention. Uh, it stated that in the event of successful unity referendums being held, that the North would automatically rejoin the European Union as part of a united Ireland. Such assurances were absent during Scotland's drive for independence and in several other instances of European nations seeking self-determination, most notably Catalonia. Added to that, the political trends uh, that have emerged in recent years which have demonstrated that the growth in the unity debate is really quite stark. 
the electoral majority of political unionism is gone. In each election since 2017, unionism failed to secure a political majority in the North in a state carefully crafted to maintain that majority. This coupled with the growth of Sinn Féin and the steady presence of constitutionally unaligned parties shows clearly that a majority of people in the North support constitutional change or could be persuaded to support constitutional change. The popularity of the debate has even moved the Irish political establishment. Former Taoiseach and Fine Gael leader Leo Varadkar recently stated that Irish unity should not simply be an aspiration of government, rather an objective. The former Taoiseach was calling on the Irish government to plan for constitutional change. Now we could be glib and say, why the hell didn't you do it when you were in office? But we'll take it now uh, better late than ever. So whilst the debate on Irish unity is rightly centred on the island of Ireland, international actors remain important. Uh, as I've stated, Irish unity provides an automatic path back to the European Union for the North. And we know that the Irish diaspora in the United States, across Europe and further afield, are energised by the debate on Irish unity. But Britain too remains an essential forum for the expansion of the unity debate. In recent years, a general ignorance or indifference to, in relation to Ireland has existed within the British political establishment. On occasion, this has manifested itself in naked hostility. This was evidenced throughout the Brexit process as Irish concerns were relegated and all too often dismissed entirely. We saw regular commentary on the border dividing Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement being both ill-informed and detached. As co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, the British government must be reminded of their responsibilities in relation to the North and held to account for the same. That includes their responsibilities in relation to the provision of unity referendums. It remains the obligation of the British government to call a referendum on Irish unity when it appears that the voting public will choose to upend the status quo. It is our job, it is the job of proponents of reunification on this island and on the island of Ireland to make the case for Irish unity in Britain. It is our job to engage with the Irish diaspora, to influence decision wherever we can, and to increase awareness of the specifics of the Good Friday Agreement and the future unity referendums contained therein. For our part, Sinn Féin is committed to working together on these issues of common ground, including the principle of self-determination. We will continue to engage with the diaspora in London and, and further afield. Too many of our people have been driven overseas by the failed policies of the Irish political establishment. We want to make Ireland a home for them again. They have a horse in this race, and their contribution to this discourse is not only beneficial, it is necessary. Recent developments point to a radical shifting of the political dial not only has unionism's political majority gone, <clears throat> but Sinn Féin has emerged as the largest party in the north of Ireland. Sinn Féin now holds the largest number of seats in local government, in the devolved assembly, and here at Westminster. With unionism's electoral majority gone, Sinn Féin on the rise, and a significant cohort of the north's electorate open to persuasion on the constitutional future of our Ireland, it is clear that preparation for a referendum on Irish unity is now considerably overdue. The British government cannot keep dodging this issue. The moment will come to name a, de a, de a date for the referendum, but first the British government must make clear its intention to trigger a referendum as per the Good Friday Agreement and set out the threshold for that referendum as it sees it. The restoration of the power sharing institutions and Michelle O'Neill's historic election as First Minister have created a moment of opportunity and we would invite the British government to seize that opportunity. Planning for constitutional change and embedding the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are not mutually exclusive. The legitimate aspirations of a growing number of people cannot be ignored. Sinn Féin leading government in the South is a real possibility. For the first time in over a century, we could have a government in Dublin that acts in the interests of the many and not of the few. I've been asked to share some thoughts on the upcoming general election in the 26 counties. In short, we're in it to win it. We're running a record number of candidates across the state and we want to lead government. We want to lead a government for change in Dublin, to build the homes that are needed, to stand up for workers and families, to fix our broken healthcare system, to be a powerful voice for peace and self-determination internationally, and yes, to plan for Irish unity. Uh, we can reunify Ireland, but we need to harness a mature, respectful conversation about constitutional change. It is our considered belief that unity referendums are coming. By the end of this decade, people north and south must have their say. The Dublin and London governments can't continue to tread water. It is now time to plan and prepare. If elected to government in Dublin, Sinn Féin would draft a, a green paper on Irish unity. 
we would convene open public and democratic forums on the, for a discussion on Irish unity. These forums, citizen-led and state-resourced, would help garner thoughts and opinions on our constitutional future. These citizens' assemblies would allow us to share our thoughts, hopes, and fears, and allow us to work to address them. We would appoint a Minister for Unification in the Department of Antioch and work tirelessly in pursuit of unity referendums. Irish unity is an idea whose time has come. We can no longer afford the division that comes with partition. We know Irish unity has the ability to unlock our economic, social, and cultural potential to do away with the obstruction that is partition and forge a new path for our country. We know that an increasing number of people in the North are openly considering their constitutional preference. And we know that raising the consciousness of Irish unity here in Britain is an essential part of moving towards and securing and winning unity referendums in the time ahead. Gormila Maira. Okay, our next speaker is Colin Harvey. Thank you, John. Um, my name is Colin Harvey. What am I? Um, I'm a professor in the School of Law at Queen's University, Belfast. I'm director of the Human Rights Centre. I'm on the Irish Human Rights Equality Commission. Um, and I'm primarily speaking in an academic capacity <coughs> tonight, although I'm also on the board of an organisation called Ireland's Future, which is a civil society organisation that's promoting this conversation about constitutional change. I just want to thank the organisers for the invitation to be here this evening and uh, to thank you for coming out in what is a fairly miserable <laughs> rainy uh, evening in, in London and uh, thank John for chairing and participants, fellow panellists for what I hope will be a discussion tonight. So really what I'm going to say is in the spirit of reflection about where we currently are in this discussion at the moment, uh, suffice to say uh, that I think we're in a, in a good place that the discussion is a well advanced, but it raises questions about where we go next in terms of these discussions. So I want to say something about the, what will sound very tedious and boring, but the framework of this, what we're actually talking about. And then I want to say something about progress so far. Where is the debate at? And I think what we're really all trying to do this evening is think about where we take that now and the role of, I don't know, England, Scotland, Wales, Britain, Westminster in this discussion. And I will uh, tell you, talk about something I've just done today, which is trying to nudge that conversation on a bit further. So first of all, in terms of the, the, the framework, and I do think this, this matters to, to, to underline, this is a Good Friday Agreement discussion, solidly anchored in the promises of that doctrine, doc, document, not only uh, as, as a matter of politics, but also as a matter of law. You know, one of the things we need to remember is that document is essentially an international legal commitment. Uh, the words in there are obligations and promises were made that in the circumstances of Brexit, people would very much like to, to be kept. Uh, so the Good Friday Agreement frames a discussion. And I, I know to many people in this room, you'll be thinking, well, why is he telling us that? We know that already. But one of the challenges I think that we faced across these islands is just getting basic recognition for that, mm -hmm. that this is a, a conversation based on the agreement endorsed law, politics, and all of that. It's reflected in the Irish Constitution, Bongrat Naheran, as we know, the, the new version of Article 3 still contains a, an imperative towards uh, United Ireland. In fact, uh, the much-loved language of a shared island actually comes from that provision of, of the Constitution. Uh, it's also British law as well. The Northern Ireland Act, 1998, Section 1, Schedule 1, again, uh, which we can talk a bit more about. So you'll be delighted to hear that all, although I'm a professor in the Law School of Queen's, I'm not going to pull up a 45-point PowerPoint slide on the technical uh, provisions on. of Section 1. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And talk about the McCord judgment and the Northern Court of Appeal and all of that, because you will, you will all flee the building, quite rightly. Um, but it's important. Uh, but to boil it down to its most basic, I think, 
right? Uh, the region in which I live and work uh, at the moment still, I think, is uh, defined by a choice. People have a choice and they've been promised a choice about their constitutional future, right? So I, you know, anybody's heard me say, turn on the radio uh, in, in Belfast or more importantly Derry, where I'm from, uh, or pick up a newspaper, people will talk about the principle of consent that people in the North ha have this right. And I suppose to sum it up, uh, we have a guaranteed choice as a matter of law. And at some point, thank you very much, we would really like to exercise that choice. We would like to be asked a question. So we can do the technical law, but, but as basics in terms of framing the debate, we have a choice. We'd like to exercise that choice and do it on an informed basis. In other words, people would like to know what they're voting for. And Brexit features very prominently in discussions about how not to do some of that stuff. So in terms of framing it, there's a choice about the future. In terms of progress, I have to say that in my, I give away my age, I'm 54, right? I'm in my mid fifties. Uh, I've never seen uh, the discussion on a united Ireland as focused and advanced as it currently is. You know, I was born in Derry in September 1970, uh, been around for a long time. And what's really intriguing about the current conversation is uh, that people are getting down to a lot of the hard work around what this looks like. You know, what the process will be like, what a united Ireland, what a new united Ireland will be like. So for example, it's striking that this year, uh, the Oireachtas Committee on the Good Friday Agreement has produced two very substantial reports on constitutional change. The most recent report on women and constitutional change, uh, reflecting the fact that the women's movement, feminists on the island of Ireland, are, are really leading an all-island conversation on this issue. In July, that Oireachtas Committee produced a report calling on the Irish government to begin planning immediately for constitutional change. Now, that's a committee of the main parties in the south of Ireland. Uh, I'm involved in Ireland's future on the management board of, of that organization. And uh, you know, many people will know that we've organized many, you know, we, we've run out of big arenas on the island of Ireland to have events. Maybe the, I don't know, uh, we've done Croke Park actually, so yeah. Aviva Stadium is next. So uh, we've done a number of very large scale events. And that reflects the fact that there's a growing civic dialogue happening across the island of Ireland on this as well. Mm -hmm. Ireland's future is only one part of that uh, discussion. And what's, I think, particularly commendable about the proposals that are coming from a range of political parties, including Sinn Féin, is that very determined focus, yes, on government preparation, but also on civic dialogue, on involving people in the discussion of hearing what people have to say. Also political parties, uh, Sinn Féin have an excellent initiative, the SDLP have a New Ireland Commission, uh, members of political parties across the island have been making substantial contributions to the conversation to the extent to which I would say there's a growing coalition, informal coalition if you like, what, beginning to emerge on the island where there is yes disagreement on a number of issues but to, what to me looking in as a as a humble academic, looks like points of consensus mm. on a number of the issues that need to be taken forward. And my view on that is, like Ireland's future view, that that's all to the good, that if we're going to achieve constitutional change in Ireland, it will need to be a coalition on the island and actually thinking beyond the island too. And last but not least, of course, I still remain gainfully employed at Queen's University of Belfast, I think today, 18th of November. Uh, universities are playing a major role in this discussion by doing a lot of the footnote laden 10,000 word, 20,000 word articles and reports on what all aspects of this would look like. And I think one of the issues there is just gaining more awareness about that work. Uh, I'll mention just one, the Orange Project, who, an abbreviation who's analyzing research uh, in the island of Ireland, north or south, or whatever it is, between the Royal Irish Academy and Notre Dame University, is producing report after report, article after article, uh, every month on the details of all this. So progress, I think, is substantial. It's in a different place, I think, on the island of Ireland than it previously was. 
But that raises the question about where now. And I want to turn to that. Uh, and, and here I think it's a matter of ref reflecting and having the discussion this evening with, with my fellow panelists. And people can, can tell me I'm wrong on this, right? So my sense is that there's the emergence of a, what looks like a broadly based coalition. If you look at the Ireland's future events that have happened a number of years, last number of years, the broad range of political parties, broad range of civil society, trade unions, civil society organizations in, in halls, on platforms, thinking through some of, of this. And that's beginning to look like the beginnings of a coalition around this question. So the discussion has become mainstreamed, if you like. It's become a part of standard debate. Again, you might say, so what? It's a Good Friday Agreement conversation. It should be. I think that is new and different. What's my sense? My sense is that the discussion now is increasingly moving towards um, bringing this work together. Right. So at the moment, it looks quite patchwork, ad hoc, research in universities, individual political parties, civil society groups, others, all bringing their suggestions and proposals to the table. Ireland's Future published a document this year called Ireland 2030 on a pathway to constitutional change. I suppose the question will be at some point somebody is going to have to present something that looks like a program for government, a prospectus, a set of proposals that people can vote on. And my sense is that the next phase of this conversation is likely to focus around that. Um, obviously, uh, there's a strong view, I think, among many people involved in that discussion that that needs the Irish government to play a central a role and there's work ongoing on that and obviously looking to manifestos at the moment and what will happen in the Irish general election uh, to come. But uh, we're in Westminster and Portcullis House so maybe just end with some reflections around that. What is glaringly striking about the discussion thus far I think is that Westminster um, is missing from the preparatory conversation right and like, look, I, 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 I don't place any great store on Westminster to solve uh, the problems of Ireland, but it, it's a glaring gap at the moment. When you look at the work of what the Oireachtas has been doing, political parties, civil society, uh, really detailed planning. As far as I can see, for example, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee has had nothing to say about this. That seems to me quite remarkable. That's not to say that the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee stops and just focuses on this. It can do other things too. But for Westminster to be entirely silent uh, seems problematic. That's also not to say that there should be an obsessive focus here. The Good Friday Agreement is quite clear. The right belongs to the people of the island of Ireland to be exercised without external impediment on the basis of rigorous impartiality and in some ways, the role of Westminster and the British government in that context, to my mind, is an enabling one, a facilitating a choice for the people of the island of Ireland, exercising the right to self-determination. However, the fact that Westminster is entirely out of the picture worries me, and I'll tell you why. I think with the growing conversation happening on the island of Ireland, yes, not going to happen tomorrow or next week, I think it has accelerated quite dramatically and will accelerate further. I think there is a risk that if the ground is not properly prepared in Britain, here uh, in London at Westminster, when this lands, uh, there could be difficulties because this will have to go through the Westminster Parliament. The Secretary of State clearly has a role in relation to triggering the referendum in the North Northern Ireland. And I think if the ground is not laid and prepared properly, including making sure people at Westminster know what this is about, I think there could be problems ahead. So I think that work needs to be done. I'll just say what I said at the start. I've been <coughs> corresponding with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee since April of this year, uh, basically encouraging the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee to conduct an inquiry, a number of hearings into this precise issue, to gather the evidence, to do the sort of work that the Oireachtas has been doing at, in a, in a very dull, boring, planning and preparing sort of way and not urging people to step into taking a constitutional posi position, but to join others in doing the hard, heavy lifting and groundwork 
of preparation that will need to be done. Okay, so I'll end by saying that uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you for being here. I think the conversation, as Doris pointed out, is at an absolutely remarkable stage. You know, in some ways, in many ways for me, quite an exciting conversation to be involved in. Often at times people want to fill the space with fear and anxiety. I don't see it that way. You know, what an amazing thing to be part of. You know, changing uh, your country for the better, achieving reunification, being there, being around when constitutional change happens. But just to end, people want to make sure it's managed in a responsible way, that preparation and planning is done. I think more and more people on the island of Ireland, privately and publicly, accept that this is the direction of travel, that this is where it's going to go, and want to get it right. So really thank you again and look forward to the conversation to come. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Holder. Thank you very much. So I'm Daniel Holder. I run CAJ, Committee on the Administration of Justice, a Belfast-based human rights NGO. We actually take no possession on the constitutional status of, of Northern Ireland, but that does not mean that we do not participate in the debate about what that might look <clears> like <throat> when it, if and when it comes to pass, when there's a referendum, and what structures would be in place in particular how rights would be protected in a new constitutional arrangement. We also stress very strongly the legitimacy of having this debate. And we stress that in the context that many people back home who've been involved in this debate have faced varying degrees of flack, hostility, and intimidation for having done so, including um, certainly in the time of the past government official assertions that even to have this type of discussion, despite it being enshrined very clearly in a, in a peace treaty, was somehow provocative. So that's, that's the context in which some of our interventions on this issue have come. That said, I've, I've been asked to talk about a completely different issue, <laughs> um, which, I'll, which I'll now get on to, which is another very pressing issue, which is the issue of um, legacy um, and the issue of the, the, the Tories' Legacy Act from the last parliament, the Northern Ireland Troubles uh, Legacy and Reconciliation Act 2023. And this is a very pressing issue. It's also a very pressing issue for the Labour Party in terms of whether Labour will honour its manifesto commitments to repeal and replace this appalling piece of legislation and indeed honour international law by, by doing so. In terms of the Legacy Act, people may well know it was universally opposed by every political party uh, in Ireland, north and south. Um, it was opposed by all of the opposition parties in this parliament when it went through. It was opposed by the Irish government, who acted to the extent that they've taken an interstate case to the European Court of Human Rights to try and stop the act. And importantly, most importantly, it was opposed by, by families, by, by victims and, and survivors. It also raised alarm at the UN at that level, as well as the Council of Europe. Um, just to quote two of the, the UN experts who looked at the, the bill, the UN Special Rapporteurs and, and, and Truth Recovery and Combating Impunity, that sort of stuff, they raised concerns the bill would quote unquote, thwart victims' rights to truth and justice, undermine the country's rule and law, and place the UK in flagrant contravention of its international human rights obligations. So just that. Um, uh, fairly serious assessment. In terms of what this bill does, well, one thing, in order to make way for this piece of legislation, Boris Johnson's government unilaterally tore up one of the bilateral agreements of the Irish Peace Settlement, the 2014 Stormont House Agreement. Now, there have been implementation issues throughout the peace process, bits of it show the, the, the commitment made over 20 years ago to the, the Pat Finuc inquiry has only been initiated now. For example, but this was the first occasion that one of the state parties to one of the, the, the agreements and treaties that makes up the peace settlement had just unilaterally torn up an agreement for comprehensive legacy uh, mechanisms to replace a set of institutions that we call the package of measures that were 
that the UK was essentially compelled to introduce because of adverse rulings by the European Court of Human Rights in cases taken by uh, my own organization and others back in the, the 2000s. And this set up a, a set of sort of ad hoc mechanisms that would be able to investigate past conflict related human rights uh, violations. We're talking the inquest systems, police ombudsman investigations, independent police investigations, civil proceedings, things like that. So what did the Tory Legacy Act do? Well, the first thing it did was shut all these mechanisms down. And it shut them down on the 1st of May uh, this year. It shut down inquests, it shut down independent police investigations, the ombudsman, even civil court proceedings. It was a widespread closing down, essentially, of the rule of law. And it occurred at a time when these mechanisms, despite having faced relentless official uh, obstruction for many, many years, the withholding of resources, the withholding of disclosure, uh, and, and various other things to obstruct their work, they were really beginning to deliver, and they were beginning to deliver fa thanks to families, their NGOs and their lawyers, using the um, European Convention on Human Rights and the domestic courts to prevent sham investigations uh, and achieve proper truth and information recovery. First thing the legacy bill did was close that down. The second thing it did was introduce an amnesty originally in the government's, uh, the, the then government's command paper, the um, uh, on the legacy bill, this was going to be a blanket amnesty that was wider actually in scope than the amnesty, the most notorious, one of the most notorious amnesties ever, which was that introduced by Augusto Pinochet in the 1970s. Um, this one would have actually been worse, it had transformed into a um, conditional immunity scheme with a rather suspiciously low threshold by the time it got into the, the legislation. But that, that ain't happening, because it was always going to be unlawful and the domestic courts have found it to be unlawful. Uh, and Labour have now made a clear commitment just to just to, to get rid of it, and I think that will <clears throat> happen. Um, but there's a third thing this legacy legislation did, and it was at the same time as closing down all of the other mechanisms, it was to establish a new legacy commission that the Tory government rushed to set up to ensure it was in place and up and running before the election took place. They appointed all the people who were running it. They've given it... £250 million to discharge its mandate over five years, having starved every other legacy mechanism of resources um, over a long period of time. And what they were essentially setting up, in our view, was a framework where proper investigations would no longer take place, but where there was discretion to conduct like touch reviews that wouldn't lead to the kind of accountability that the previous mechanisms has, and for good measure, um, they appointed a former senior IUC commander as the uh, commissioner for investigations within this new legacy body, despite the requirements of human rights law or, or, of independence of those who uh, conduct such investigations. One of the things we did as NGOs ourselves in the Pat Finucane Centre at the time when we realised that official legacy <coughs> processes were just going to be shut down was we asked the Human Rights Centre at the University of Oslo to establish an international panel of experts, which composed of former police officers, human rights lawyers, academics, um, NGOs and others, to produce a report on the extent to which there had been uh, state impunity for human rights violations during the Northern Ireland conflict. Part of the context of this was the mobilization for the legacy bill, as you may well remember, was the false contention that existing legacy investigations constituted some sort of witch hunt against um, military veterans. Um, therefore, the panel produced this report. We've got some copies of it here. It's also available uh, online. That, by contrast to that, concluded that the UK had operated a widespread, systematic, and systemic practice of impunity that protected the security forces from sanction during the conflict. It includes three thematic areas one looking at state killings, one at torture, one conclusion. What, and the third one, collusion, sorry. Um, it looks at the early part of the conflict where, for example, the, the British Army shot dead 200 people. Um, whilst the rule of law in theory applied, there were zero convictions, in fact, zero prosecutions, and in fact, zero police investigations um, at that time. It was very broad impunity, uh, despite the uh, majority of those being shot uh, at the time being undisputedly on unarmed. Some inroads had been made into this backdrop of impunity by the package of measures, by the existing legacy mechanisms. You had the police ombudsman. They had uncovered 
significant patents, some systemic, of police collaboration with loyalist paramilitaries that included the involvement of state agents in arms importations, the involvement in state agents in human rights violations, including killings, the passing of information to paramilitaries by state actors, failures to investigate crimes involving state actors and state agents, failures to warn persons their lives were at imminent risk, and the destruction of records. Equally, the Legacy Act shut down legacy inquests. It closed down 38 legacy inquests that will continue. A number had managed to take place, and quite a few, but like the um, Bloody Sunday inquiry, it was an inquiry, not an inquest, but um, one of the predecessor massacres to Bloody Sunday, the Ballin Murphy massacre by the Parachute Regiment, the official truth was essentially rewritten by the inquest that found that the victims were innocent and the use of force was entirely unjustified and in breach of the European Convention of Human Rights. A series of other inquests have come to the same conclusion uh, in most of the other military shootings they, they, they've looked at. There were also a large number of civil cases taken against the military. Over 575 were live in the courts. Um, a lot of them were closed down by the Legacy Act, though that's now been found unlawful. And these weren't just looking at reparations for, for victims. These were also leading to quite significant narrative verdicts. For example, the, the Liam Holden case um, that made findings that the British Army had waterboarded. Not that that word was ever used until the Iraq War, but you can read from the narrative it is precisely that, a torture technique that is used to extract a false confession from the individual in question. There are other civil cases that have found collusion. Then you have the Operation Canova investigations into state agents within the, the IRA that found the entire system of tolerating, facilitating, and directing state agents in killings, torture, and other serious human rights violations was unsurprisingly unlawful, um, and also shielding individual state, act, state agents from uh, justice was also uh, had no legal basis. This is what was being produced by the package of measures. So we get to the Legacy Act that closes it all down. Again, there was a witch hunt narrative that somehow legacy investigations were unfairly investigating soldiers. A lot of us think to be honest, that the Tories didn't really care that much about squaddies going to jail. And the context was that actually not a single soldier has done a day in jail as a result of legacy investigations. And also, the things they were shutting down, like inquests and civil proceedings, don't actually put people in jail. Um, they just lead to information recovery and historical clarification. The real motivation behind this Legacy Act was to change the narrative and retain an official narrative that was increasingly being disproved by independent investigations and judicially verified facts. The agenda behind the act, in our view, was to close down proper independent investigations, replace them with light touch reviews with a significant degree of ministerial control. It was also very specifically to conceal patterns of human rights violations relating to state agents. So the new legacy body, can't actually have the final say in what goes into its reports to families. Government ministers will be able to redact them to remove any information uh, about MI5 involvement, about special branch involvement, or about military intelligence. This is codified into the, le in into the legislation. Um, and this is what we think this Legacy Act is all about. But you don't have to take my word for it. Let's listen to what the actual architects of the Act said when they were introducing it and in the prelude to it. Just to quote three Secretaries of State, Brandon Lewis, when he introduced the legacy bill, said that the existing legacy investigations were rewriting history and must be put to a halt. They were feeding a pernicious and distorted view of the past, promoted and peddled by those with a vested interest in presenting the British state as aggressor. That was really a, 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 his reference to his own justice system um, that was producing uh, these findings. It echoes a, a, a notorious speech by Theresa Villiers in 2016, where she spoke of the pernicious counter-narrative, i.e. that legacy investigations were putting forward a, a, a counter-narrative to, to the official view of, of the conflict that were placing the state at the hearts of atrocities. And then another one in 2018, Karen Bradley, when she was pushed before the Defence Select Committee in this building. To, to introduce the statute for, uh, of limitations, either so that soldiers couldn't be prosecuted, said, well, look, um, the, the problem with that is it wouldn't stop inv investigations and inquests, which were, quote, unquote, part of the problem. So inquests were part of the problem. Investigations were part of the problem. Um, and what she really wanted to do was stop those 
and ensure that, quote unquote, our service veterans and former police officers do not face harassment in the courts, i.e. the due process of law. This was the motivation behind the, the Legacy Act. It's gone through the, the High Court and the Court of Appeal. They found the amnesty to be unlawful. So far, they've found the uh, national security veto provisions to be unlawful, although Labour have now announced that they may appeal that element of the, the, the ruling. Um, if you look at some of the policy papers that were revealed in the court documents as well, it shows that the reason why the Stormont House Agreement and the package of measures weren't con considered for continuation was because they would have continued investigations into veterans. They wanted much more light touch uh, reviews. Um, the UN Human Rights Committee has raised concerns about this new legacy body. Um, uh, they've raised concerns about its allegations of its lack of independence, the absence of power of investigation to guarantee the right, the truth for victims. They've called for it to be repealed or reformed and for the UK to adopt proper mechanisms with guarantees of independence, transparency and genuine investigative power that discharge the state party's human rights obligations to deliver truth, justice and effective remedies. Uh, where we're at is the new legacy body's been up and running for six months now. In order to make way for it, well, I've given you some of the figures, but there was well over a thousand cases that were shut down. How many investigations is the new legacy body conducting after six months? Five. Five is the, is the figure published on their website. And they say some of them are multiple requests, but it's five investigations. Now, if you take a step back, you'd think, well, that's an absolute abject failure to go from hundreds of cases to a legacy body that's only doing five investigations. It is, of course, not an abject failure for the architects and the agenda behind setting it up, because the agenda was precisely to close down legacy investigations. So where a Labour manifesto commitment is absolutely fantastic, replace and replace the Legacy Act, Labour and government have continuously reiterated that they will reinstate, will remove the ban on civil proceedings, which is great, but they haven't done it yet and could do it quite quickly. And they've rolled back somewhat on a commitment to reintroduce inquests. But most significantly of all, a unilateral was decision was made simply to retain this new legacy commission and, and tweak it or reform it in some way, but not to replace it. And that's deeply concerning. Um, as you've seen from the numbers, very few victims have the confidence to go anywhere near this body. Um, people are steadfastly opposed to it. The Irish government has said it would need substantive root and branch reform to make it ECHR compliant, and it's generally broadly opposed. But we don't have a path yet to its reform and removal. Um, by way of balance, I should say that the ACRAR does have some does have some vocal supporters in this parliament. Kate Hoey supports it. Um, the opposition front bench supports it. Um, Lord Kane, perhaps the, the uh, member of the House of Lords most associated with the legislation because he steered it through the House of Lords, supports it. All of those people I've just mentioned have previously advocated an agenda of shutting down proper investigations. And why would they want to keep this new commission if they weren't confident that it was going to deliver on their agenda? And that's where we're, we're now sitting. We have a manifesto commitment to, to repeal and replace. Uh, yet we have some quite considerable rolling back on that <clears throat> and a lot of work to do to get that anywhere near over the lake. Our next speaker was to be Nadine Finch, but Nadine, some of you know, had an operation a short while ago and she's still recovering. So um, Angie Burt has stepped into the breach to read Nadine's, um, Nadine's speech, okay. I was trying to explain to my grandchildren the other week the period in which Sinn Féin were not allowed to appear on TV and we, actors had to speak the speech and the rest of it. It's a similar role, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put on an accent. <laughs> I'll try not to sound like one of those people who used to pretend to be Sinn Féin. I'll do my best anyway. So. Um, yeah, so I'm Angie and I'm one of the founding members and former secretary of Labour for Irish Unity. And as I say, I'm reading out Nadine's speech that she was sadly going to give and can't tonight. So Nadine is the vice chair 
of Labour for Irish Unity, okay, um, formerly the chair. Okay, so she begins by saying many thanks to Angie, thank you, <laughs> for reading this out for me. I had hip replacement surgery last month and was a little over optimistic about the speed at which I would recover and be able to travel across London and into Port Cullis House and sit on the panel at this meeting. I'd like to thank the speakers and of course John MacDonald on behalf of Labour for Irish Unity for their ongoing support and collaboration. Labour for Irish Unity was established during the heady days of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership when the Labour Party seemed much more open to change and diversity. A small group of us met in a series of bars and pubs in Liverpool during a Labour Party conference and later in the London Irish Centre to establish what became Labour for Irish Unity. And all of us though had very vivid memories of the failure of successive leaders of the Labour Party to recognise the settler colonialism experienced in Ireland over the centuries and the continuing civil rights breaches and abuses which were still unresolved. So from the outset, membership was made open to members of the trade union movement and Irish organisations, as well as the Labour Party. A prescient move. We now have a Labour government, but one whose actions in relation to the war in Gaza <coughs> indicates both their lack of understanding of the consequences of settler colonialism and a lack of respect for the basic principles of international law. Their views and actions also bode ill for Britain's oldest and one of its remaining colonies, that of Northern Ireland. Many of us, such as John and myself, who've campaigned for Irish unity and civil rights in Ireland within the Labour Party over decades, have either had our membership of the party terminated or had the whip in Parliament removed. Many others have resigned in despair. But this doesn't mean that we have abandoned the struggle for Irish unity or justice or no longer see ourselves as part of the wider trade union and labour movement. These are more essential than ever. In these very turbulent times politically in Britain and internationally, Labour for Irish Unity have been joining with others in the Irish community and beyond to give a voice to those who believe in human rights, equality and collective action. Our banner is raised at the many demonstrations in support of Gaza. We use all available media outlets to argue for the full repeal of the Legacy Act and for the need for wide discussion and detailed preparation for an Irish border poll. We're also forging new and strong alliances with both trade union activists and those in the emerging social movements in defence of right to protest within the black and climate change community and with those campaigning against restrictions to the right to protest. <clears throat> those of us who are from the first, second or third generation Irish community are likely to remember their own parents and grandparents' disbelief that their English friends and neighbours avoided any meaningful discussion of politics and religion, thus lead, leaving the leadership of English political parties to use politics and religion to divide and rule for their own benefit. 
I wondered whether my own memories of family dinner tables were not typical, but I recently saw a survey entitled Racism and Ethnic Inequality in a Time of Crisis. It found that 84% of Irish respondents to the survey had a political affiliation and 78% supported the Black Lives Matter movement. The Irish community and its allies know that collective and principled action has a ripple effect no matter what the apparent odds are. The uprising of 1916 is just one example, as was the example, as was the action of workers in Dunn stores in Dublin in 1984 who refused to handle goods from South Africa in protest at its apartheid regime. At the moment in Britain, many from the Irish community do not have a political party that seems to speak for them on Irish unity or civil rights. But the wider labour movement is stepping up in a more public way than for decades. Of course, members of the Irish community have been prominent in trade union struggles throughout the years. We just got to remember the Match Girls strike of 1888 and the London Dockers strike in 1889 and the role of Jim Larkin in the early 20th century. And now, the roll call of first and second generation Irish leading trade union strikes and actions is very extensive. For example, Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey in the RMT, Mick Whelan in ASLA, Sharon Graham in Unite, Joe Grady in the University College Union, Neve Sweeney in the National Education Union, and Pat Cullen former Chief Executive of the Royal College of Nursing and now a Sinn Féin MP. Labour for Irish Unity in Sinn Féin held a very successful fringe meeting at this year's Trades Union Congress in Brighton and planned to organise a further meeting next year and hopefully a fringe meeting at some individual trade union conferences. We'll also be working with Colin Harvey to encourage British politicians to accept that a border poll is metaphorically just around the corner and not a mirage on the far horizon, as Keir Starmer appears to believe. We'll also be working to explain to those <clears throat> in Britain that the Good Friday Agreement may have much to commend it, but it doesn't contain sufficient detail to ensure that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland will honour the spirit of the agreement when deciding when and how to call a border poll. When doing so, we will be engaging with all political parties, including Sinn Féin and Plaid Cymru, as well as the trade unions and social movements. We very much support Daniel's analysis of the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Act 2023, and we will be highlighting the ongoing colonial nature of the Act. The government's decision to retain parts of it and siphon off the investigations into some historic murders to the Independent Commission for Reconciliation and Information Recovery indicates that the Labour government doesn't trust the Northern Ireland judiciary and lawyers to resolve these cases. The government is also now appealing against the decision by the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal that the veto granted to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in the Legacy Act on the disclosure of some, sen some evidence deemed to be sensitive is unlawful. It was the failure by the police service of Northern Ireland 
and the British Security Services to disclose key evidence that delayed and frustrated inquests and legal inquiries for the past 50 years or more, he should not be repeating this mistake. Finally, the first Prevention of Terrorism Act was introduced in 1974 as a means to ensure that debate on the actions of the British state in Northern Ireland may lead to prosecution and to isolate the Irish into a suspect community. The government is now increasingly using the Terrorism Act 2000 to stifle debate and protest in relation to Gaza, police actions, climate change, and opposition to racism and fascism. Labour for Irish Unity will be sharing its historic and current experiences as a contribution to other organisations now campaigning for justice and equality. It will also be campaigning against the suppression of debate and protest. And she finishes by saying, if you wish to join with us in any of these activities and campaigns, please sign up either as a member or a supporter. And Alana, who's sitting here, um, has membership forms and can enrol you this evening. Gura Maigan. Nadine wasn't here to introduce herself, but as you know, as Angie said, she's been an active member of the Labour Party and, and virtually every Irish organisational front we've ever established over the years, yeah. as well as being a brilliant lawyer and and eventually a judge. I was always yeah. hoping that I, if I got prosecuted again, I'd <laughs> <laughs> um, Liz has left us, but Richard Berg, my colleague, is the MP for Leeds, has joined us as well. Thanks, Richard. Shall I throw it open to comments, questions? Yeah, Austin, come in. Yeah, sorry. Um, <coughs> you know, I'm Austin Harding. I set up trade unions for our students. I'm a trade union as an officer for the Labour for our students. I'm one of the founding members. But this is very important to promote it in trade unions as well because we've been under attack for a number of years by lawyers and union sections for trying to promote a Republican cause in the British Trade Union League, which we believe. Um, so this hasn't been easy to try and get it off the ground. But now that we're building for border polls, we're building for our unity. Over in the Republic of Ireland, we now have a very powerful movement for trade unions for a union united Ireland. And now it gives us the opportunity to build that in Britain as well. So I think it's important that we start uh, building that mass movement in the trade unions, going out there. Uh, we encourage people in trade unions or active who go to conferences every year to put up motions debating uh, Irish unity straight away. Now, we've debated previously in my trade union, uh, Scottish independence. Um, in workplaces and branches. It's time we did the same for Irish unity as well. I think that's really important how we go forward. Um, I know that just in this year they talked about the Irish diaspora for leadership on trade unions. That wasn't the case last year. Although if we could still walk past outside the CEC conference, um, we'll be speaking about the leaflets. But we did have Philippe Hayes. He did an enormous amount of work mm -hmm. as General Secretary, retired General Secretary of the CWU. He actually first only General Secretary who brought Sinn Fein together and the unions at a TEC conference back in 2006. So, you know, it's important how we build that movement. And uh, for years it's been terrible, particularly in the labor movement. There was a trade unionist by the name of the Don 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 Donovan, who died in 2018, in an old people's home. He got regular visits by the Sinn Féin MP, Michelle Gildingham. Now, um, what happened was he put up a motion in the Labour Party conference in the 1960s. I, can't, I don't know which year it was, but he told you this, which is quite startling. He was calling for the abolition of apartheid in Northern Ireland. It was ex the motion, and he told me that the chair of the Standing Waters Committee was James Callaghan, the future Prime Minister, uh, would you believe? Um, so this is frightening. I mean, we need to tackle this um, culture of apathy towards Irish unity. We need to tackle, of course, um, the appalling attitudes of where we get snubbed in Westminster, but we also need to take it to the trade union and the TBC conference. I was just asked to bring this point up about trade unions for Irish unity. So we're going to try and get it all cracking, get it moving. We're going out to England, Scotland, Wales, and the North Ireland as well. We've got trade in the North Ireland greatly interested. I think let's go forward. Solidarity.
Thanks. Thanks. Questions or comments? Um, my question to Colin um, um, and, and Bill Dylan as well. Um, I mean, you know, we're fighting against the press. So anything that is going to be in the uh, United Ireland Manifesto, it's going to take <coughs> a lot to get that information to the doorstep. You know, that would be a crumble in, in the press because they're not, they're not going to be favourable to this, I imagine, unless it's a Sinn Féin government. How long do you think it's going to take that manifesto of the reality of what's going, to, what the United Ireland would be like? Uh, when does that? When do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> Shall I just mm -hmm. um, uh, Alan? Yeah, Alan. Yeah. Yeah. Alan. yeah, and and um, Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Like, just the sense of a growing civic conversation, right? That that is happening across, I think the trade union movement are absolutely central to, to, to that, right? And in some ways people are getting on with it, you know, which is how things, good things happen, right? So the government's come along afterwards and they'll claim it was all our idea, right? And credit for it and all that, but that's important, right? So I think that, um, I think that the discussion is in a different space, but I want to answer the question by reframing the, the, the the discussion because I think there's a bit of a sense that it's framed that the Secretary of State will wake up one day and um, it'll be triggered and whatever or a poll will and I think we need to move away from that framing and reframe it as a sort of planned and managed process where civic society governments and political parties are involved in an early stage at uh, pl planning this, right? And it, maybe me, in my de delusional sense of seeing these things, you see the beginnings of those sorts of conversations happening. The difficulty, I think, is when you're arguing at Westminster with the British government, is the British government will quite probably, understandably, respond, well, if the Irish government isn't pressing London on this, why would a British government do that? So in terms of building towards something that looks like a program for government or a prospectus, that's going to emerge in wider debates, but it probably the Irish government's going to be central to that. That's why you know it's so uh, encouraging to hear proposals. Actually, the Labour Party in Ireland, big section in their manifesto on uniting Ireland for all Sinn Féin's proposals, you know, so beginning to see even the shared island suggestions that are emerging around that. So that, that for that manifesto or program for government to emerge in a proper way, preparations need to start now for that um, and getting that right. But if you look at what's happened on the island of Ireland in recent years, both in political life and civic life, you know, th there are plenty of people on the island of Ireland that when attention is turned to winning, elections or winning referendums um, maybe not so much earlier this this year but know how to do that and are well versed at doing that i think there'll be tensions and difficulties in that conversation because if you think about it you're trying to build a broad coalition to agree on something and a set of proposals but i think on that that, that whatever emerges in the far end of it won't be the the last word you know a discussion on a new ireland will continue even when there is a united ireland actually so it's just really wanted to make the point tonight that I genuinely like stepping back, I'm sort of immersed in this stuff and I've put my cards on the table and all of that. That's what it looks like to me. It looks like we're heading into that conversation. Um, it, it, it becomes difficult if the Irish government continues to remain very cautious. That's why Leo Varadkar's comments this year were really striking, you know. Uh, uh, and the comments of a number of politicians and others. Um, but uh, once the focus turns on it, I think it can be done. Um, and I think a convincing and persuasive case can be made for it. I don't know if that answers uh, your, your question. Yeah, well, uh, I'm just looking at the date and time when I can go. Well, the, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to say something. People don't agree with me on it. The, the Ireland's Future document is labelled Ireland 2030. Yeah. 
And that's why I would like to see a reframing of the current mm. conversation. Mm. I don't like the sort of British Secretary of State wakes up one morning, looks at a yeah. poll, goes, I'm going to trigger a border poll type thing. Unilateral, unilateral actions by any British government fill me with dread and fear, <laughs> I have to say. It has to be managed and planned. And I do think I'm a supporter of a time frame and a timetable. I think without a timetable and framing in that way, the dynamism is problematic. Dates focus minds, so I would be supportive of a framework. And it's interesting that more and more people are talking about this decade as, or the next 10, you know, so I think that's important. So yes, I would absolutely, time frame would help. And we looked at Scottish referendum, a time frame helped there, I think, in focusing minds towards 2014 as well. Thank you. Um, I think Colin, I agree entirely with Colin's assessment of the trajectory of these things and with the, the practical assessment that only, only a state, only a government has the adequate reach and resources to do this properly. Uh, that's why the packages that we put into our manifesto and Colin's right to acknowledge the, the commitments of others um, point to that citizen civic discussion forums citizens assemblies whatever they're called pulling people together and pulling those threads together but complemented by statutory preparation by by resourcing proper uh, engagement on an all iron basis to plan for our future there's a, a misnomer amongst people in the north that i've discovered um in respect of the scotland's future document that was prepared ahead of the scottish independence referendum that it was an smp production it wasn't it was a production of the scottish government mm -hmm. and those people who are calling for individual political parties to do plans like that in isolation um, probably underestimate the partisanship of politics. I present a plan tomorrow on Irish Unity and you'll drive people from the debate. The SCLP does it, they'll do the same for Yale for sure. Mm -hmm. You can't have a United Ireland if you can't house its citizens. <coughs> um, but the, the, the notion of people coming together and contributing <coughs> chipping in on key themes and allowing those threads to be pulled together in an organized and structured and resourced way is the best possible best possibility of us producing that perspective or perspectives and having people engage and, and buy into it and i think realistically that's the only um that's the only direction of travel that, that will viably lead to constitutional change and examples across the globe have shown us that uh, be it with the reunification of germany which was staged uh until you know like a like a lock process on a canal until one, so the social was sorted, the political was sorted, the economic was sorted, and, and they did it a very procedural way. Or the constitutional change that was brought about in South Africa, which was, um, which was wholly citizen-led by a state that was energized and liberated uh, and engaged with people beyond our widest comprehension or, or, or understanding, um, and actually developed constitutional change as a process of reconciliation in and of itself, which I think is a model that we need to, to be uh, acutely aware of as we uh, continue in our journey in Ireland. Can I just comment as well? Jackie Connor, uh, my colleague who works with me here, as you can maybe comment too, but in, Westminster is going to be the last place to actually generate the discussion and debate that needs to happen, the preparatory work that needs to happen to secure the referendum and then the outcome of it implemented. Um, in, in terms of Ireland, there is no debate in Westminster at the moment on Ireland. No debate. The level of discussion is is minimal, to say the to say the least. Um, and it's once the Good Friday Agreement was signed and embedded, what happened here was a huge sigh of relief. And let's not just move on. And in the legacy. Um, debate it was a very limited debate here as well so irish issues aren't paid attention to or they're minimally paid attention to here um, and that was reconfirmed over the brexit issue as well and people are so scarred by a referendum of brexit the last thing that people want to talk about here is another referendum of any sort so that that's the overlay that we have to recognize uh, in in this place um, and hence that's why you've seen only three mps here tonight because there isn't that element of interest and in fact quite the reverse there's almost let's not talk about it as long as it's quiet in the north 
all we're interested in is just concentrating on the issues here um, uh, rather than elsewhere. So that's the attitude here. And that's why my view is Westminster will be the last place. So the role that has to play for the Irish diaspora, it's, it will be civil society here that will lead on this issue so that then eventually the politicians will catch up. So the debate and discussion of, of, of what the prospects are for the future has to be within civil society. And to a large extent, that is about the Irish community organisations here. But the point that Austin and Angie and others have made, our, our biggest and most fertile ground is the labour and trade union movement, and actually it's the trade union movement. That seems to be the most fertile ground for having a proper debate about the future of Ireland at the moment. And it's partly, as has been said, is the, the trade union movement historically in this in this um, country has been populated by by Irish people, um, often in leadership positions. And we're quite fortunate at the moment because of the coincidence of that number of general secretaries with an Irish background that the one way we can best influence a Labour <coughs> government is via that trade union discussion. And that's why, if we if we're serious about building up and mobilising the Irish diaspora in this country. It's looking at where's the easiest routes, and the trade union movement actually is one of those uh, easiest routes, as well as the, the various Irish organisations. But don't expect the debate to be led by Westminster at all. It will follow the civil society engagement that we undertake. And that's why the Labour Friends of Irish Unity, I think, can play a significant role, because small organisations like that can be the catalyst for a wider debate. And that's why I, I hope it will be. But. At once, once that civil society work has gone on, Westminster will start re reacting to that because individual MPs, for example, will be engaged with by their local communities or Labour MPs by their trade union in that way. So it will, the debate here will emerge like a steam from a kettle, but the steam that kettle has to be boiled by the people on the ground in civil society at the moment because it's very difficult getting any form of debate here about it. And, the Labour Party positioning um, is, I think, will be difficult as well. That will be a struggle in itself, as you've seen Keir Starmer said he will, in any referendum, be campaigning for a status quo, basically. So that, that will be an issue to be confronted. And the, the, popular, the, the population of the Parliamentary Labour Party and the Labour Party itself has changed, particularly in recent years. But there's still a bedrock of support, I think, for Irish unity within the party itself historically so the potential is there but again it will come from the grassroots of the party and the trade union movement rather than from the leadership at the moment they'll want to avoid the issue we've got enough on our plate for a new government much more to work on than that so it will, they'll be seen as a peripheral issue but if we can build up a climate of opinion eventually they'll catch up and i think that's the, that's the work we've got to do and that's always been the case on ireland to be honest on issues here uh, always has been you know and again, I don't expect any damaging conversion of any Secretary of State for the Northern Ireland until they have to. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. It's been really fascinating listening to the speaker, so thank you all for that. Um, and in case people wonder why I'm here or why I'm speaking, because I think we have a lot in common. I'm from Colony Me Too, where the Chicago Group is called. Um, and in the discussion of the challenges that you're facing, <coughs> It's a very exciting proposition of our machine to be very stimulating. And I think you know, British and English politics have been so boring. The challenges he faces, some of the challenges that I'm facing as well, and that's why we're here, um, is to actually make unity and to build alliances because we're fighting on the same ground in many ways. We're fighting the fight for reparations and slavery, and we know we can get support from people who understand what colonization has done and what oppression is about because of race. Um, we are leading a fight on the outside and right you said it's not going to happen in Parliament here. So we're building our alliances and we're looking to the trade unions in the same way that you are doing to build support and to build momentum towards reparations. And, um, it's very much as is Irish unity in the public eye almost on a regular basis, you can hardly pick up your paper without seeing something about reparation or somebody coming out and saying how the ancestors of the enslavers or 
you know, some people who are fighting for change and fighting making this demand, and we hear from the Mid Party, they're not apologizing and they're not paying reparations. It didn't surprise us. And we know that would be the position for a long time until we can force them to the table to have that conversation that you're talking about. That is so important. They're even refusing to have a conversation with our leaders from the Caribbean, and we intend to keep putting pressure to do that. So if there was a question I would have for anybody here, it would be, what's your number, what's your email address, so we can make alliances, exactly. that's what we can. I might have John's in my address book somewhere. <laughs> yeah. but the others, I look forward to having a conversation sometime. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. The reparations debate has opened up a whole range of opportunities, hasn't it? Particularly in terms of Ireland. And it's waking people up to the whole process of colonialism again, which is quite interesting. Any opportunity we can? Come on. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Paul Ryan, I'm chair of the Labour Irish Unity. And uh, I've got the uh, unenviable task of uh, making a few uh, requests here. Um, first of all, um, the the, the enviable task is to say thank you very much to all the speakers, um, two of, um, three of whom, I apologize, have traveled a long distance from Ireland overnight to, uh, to get to here to make their presentation, and we'll be traveling back in the morning, um, and to uh, John McDonnell, uh, the chair of the meeting. So we, we thank, uh, thank all the uh, panel, and of course yourselves for uh, coming to this meeting. Um, Membership of the FIU has been uh, mentioned, and here are the, the forms referred to. We have plenty for you to sign up. We're going to lock the door at the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely, because the next point is about money. Uh, clearly, we're on the parliamentary estate, and we haven't had to pay for the, uh, the room tonight to come through John's office. Uh, but usually, we do have to pay for uh, booking of rooms, hire of rooms, and um, we've got to publicise this. There are expenses associated with the uh, with the meeting, etc., etc. And so we thought it inappropriate to have a bucket here in, in Parliament. So we've got a bit of and uh, up to the method of uh, of paying by an app. So if you've got your card or your phone, you can pay or maybe pay sorry, make a donation, make a donation. Uh, uh, so I'll thank you in advance for that. Um, finally, if uh, anybody wants to receive information about those priority units who have not signed up, please complete this call. Um, so I'd just like to, to follow on from the, the discussion with a, with a couple of points. Um, there has been a wide-ranging discussion, and it highlights, I think, the, the number of uh, areas in which we can work. Um, but of course, we've got limited resources, so we need to focus our, our attention. And there's been, some, um, there's been some very good suggestions there which I'd like to, to amplify on. Uh, I think the first thing uh, was that, uh, to reiterate what, what John was saying about the trade union movement, we had a fantastic meeting mm -hmm. in Bright at the TUC in mm -hmm. September, and hopefully uh, there will be a trickle down um, into the various trade unions there, and as alluded to in uh, Nadine's speech, uh, we hope to hold meetings at individual trade union meetings in the coming year. And perhaps most importantly, hopefully there will be uh, the grassroots movement, so that this issue is raised through um, through individual branches by by individual trade union members. Not that we realistically expect that to become a very big issue, but I think, as Colin was saying, the idea of seeding the idea where it is not currently growing, getting people used to the idea of Irish unity is important, and that in turn will hopefully feed into the into the MPs out in the country, so that when the matter is finally discussed here, it's not landing cold. Um, but in real terms, the pressure on Secretary of State has to come from the people of Northern Ireland. They are the people under the GSA who will determine his decision. Um, but um, we here can, can uh, undertake undertake work, and again referred to by, by Colin and by uh, Nadine's speech about working with the select committees, uh, particularly the, the Northern Ireland select committees. It's they who are scrutinising the policy and the implementation of government uh, through Hillary Benn's department. And coincidentally, that work could start 
tomorrow, because here at two o'clock in this very room, the, the, the Northern Ireland Select Committee is questioning Hillary Benn on the work of the department. So why isn't there a question from that committee to say what preparations have you are you making, have you started to make for a border vote? Because that is the direction of travel. We know that it will take years of preparation. You know, Hillary Benn, being chair of the Brexit committee, what a complete mess that was by the lack of preparation. Uh, whatever your position about that, he has the direct evidence of how not to run a referendum. And he has the opportunity tomorrow to answer to the select committee, which is an important part of the UK government and democratic process. So I think, I think we need to, all of us who have contacts with members of that committee, um, and I should, I should say confidential things about them, so I, I won't say anything about them, uh, but we should, we should contact them when, uh, when and as we are able to raise the question, the key questions about Ireland and what they really need to be asking uh, Hillary Benn and his department about. And in addition, we will hopefully be working with Colin in the new year to provide them with information and point them in the direction uh, of this mass of um, academic work and governmental governance work that is being produced that is available there for them to discuss. And they may have their head in the sand that it isn't going to happen, but the reality is they know it is going to happen and they need to start preparing now. So, sorry. How do we get to this meeting for two o'clock? You just turn up. You <laughs> just turn up. Why don't we all just turn up for it's, it's, it's open to the public, yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You I can't participate, but you can watch. We tried that participating and get thrown out. <laughs> yeah, you could try that and get thrown out. <laughs> but it's a good point. The Northern Ireland Committee has been not particularly influential, to be honest, but it's a new go. It's a new parliament. Got lots of um, new people on there, new members as well. That could we could uh, we could I suppose it, ensure that we're exchanging, having a regular dialogue with, and on that basis bring them up to speed on some of these issues. Really, I've got an anecdote on the Northern Ireland Committee. Tony Benn and I and Jeremy were blocking the, the City of London bill. Um, that gave more votes to businesses than individuals. We blocked it for five years because it was a private member's bill. And I got called in and meet with the City of London MP and uh, the remembrancer from the City of London. And they knew I, they blocked us from going on any select committees for years. And they knew I desperately wanted to go on Northern Ireland Committee. So they offered me membership of the Northern Ireland Committee in exchange for dropping my opposition to the bill. <laughs> I reported it to the Standards Commissioner. There was an investigation, and not one person in the room remembered any reference to the Northern Ireland. <laughs> 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 it's brilliant to report what you say, Colin, because it's not much opportunity of getting off the ground in, uh, in Westminster. Uh, I've come down specially from a place called Leeds, where I'm a little bit more optimistic of certain things that are happening there. I mean, one, yeah. unfortunately, um, Richard, Richard Bergen, who is an outstanding member of parliament in, mm -hmm. in, in Leeds, has taken enormous initiatives on human rights and self-determination, specifically concerning Gaza. Mm -hmm. For years, we, we've had a, a Palestinian film festival, and Richard, in fact, opened mm -hmm. this only last week mm. and he did the same 10, 10, 10, 10 years ago and I, I think the thing is we've got someone else we've got another member of parliament in Leeds uh, who's called Hilary Benn I haven't had much success with him on, on Gaza but it, it is interesting that there is quite a lot of discussion taking place I'm very much involved in the, in the cooperative movement, yeah. we had a speaker yeah. only three, three, three months ago uh, on the question of, 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 of Northern Ireland. Yeah. And I, I think it's very important to be looking at all these opportunities. Uh, for 15 years, I was a Labour member of the European Parliament for, for, for Leeds, and I was in the campaign group, and that's where the privilege of meeting John 
with, with Paula. And I, I think I learned so much working with colleagues from the Irish Republic, besides the rest of Europe, uh, about the importance of self-determination and not, not, not giving up with the difficulties. People say the world is falling apart, Britain's falling apart, the national there are a lot of good things happening. Mm -hmm. and I think if it's worth getting out of bed in the morning, it is worth being optimistic. And, and I, I think there are, talking about civil societies, uh, you know, we in, in, in Yorkshire have a population actually the same size as Scotland. And we are interested in self-determination. And as far as the European Union is concerned, there's something called subsidiarity, which is what it's about as well. In getting decisions taken at the, 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 the most relevant le le level that, that, that relates to services. So I, I think it's not only just Leeds and Yorkshire, there are other parts of the country. So I, I think, it, 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 I mean, my trade union, I'm in mean, a, a, a UJ, mm -hmm. we are a, a union, it's a, it's a union of Ireland and, and yeah. the UK. A lot, a lot of organisations are part of this as well. So, uh, I know somebody was threatening to lock the door, but I'm going to have to leave within minutes to catch the train all the way back to Leeds, so I've risked risk, risk coming down actually. And, uh, but I, I, I've learned so much from this. I think the speakers have been absolutely fantastic. It was a wonderful meeting we had at uh, the Labour Party conference as well. I mean, that was a very inspiring meeting. And there's been quite a bit of follow up. So i just like to say I'm privileged to be here. I, I, I think there are opportunities, particularly now. Uh, we, we talk about the present government saying the priority, the priority is growth, mm -hmm. and yet we're still accepting and putting up with Brexit. You know, even the chair of the Bank of England says you've got to do something about about growth, and, and you know we've, we've lessons to learn from the Republic and from Northern Ireland on, on all of these international issues. So. Thank you for having me, and I'm going to catch the train. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to close in a couple of minutes, but I was going to ask any members of the panel if they want to say a few words before we leave. Well, I think, I think we've, we've covered a serious amount of ground there. I think particularly the contributions of the other panelists have been informing even for ourselves who are in the middle of this debate and this discussion. Uh, again, to repeat my thanks to everybody for, for turning out. Um, please take uh, our friends in, in Labour for Irish Unity uh, up on their offer of signing up, getting involved, keeping the correspondence going. Um, and yeah, thank you very much and, and safe home. Again, I used to work in the University of Leeds, actually, and uh, I remember actually meeting Hilary Benn in that context many months ago. But uh, thank you all again. Thanks for to Labour for Irish Unity for the invitation <coughs> and happy, like many people involved in this discussion, to help. And there, it's very much a collective of which I'm a small part of many people who are involved in, in the discussion. In terms of what we're asking in many ways, but it's, the, it's an exciting, it's sometimes presented as a grand project, but in some ways it's a rather basic ask. You know, when you think about uh, the current government. We're asking for a government in London, I'm going to shock you here, that respects the Good Friday Agreement and international obligations, right? So we, we need a government in London, a Secretary of State, to respect the Good Friday Agreement. Um, shocked, I know, to, to hear that. Um, but that's important, you know, because in many ways uh, it's our choice and London needs not to get in the way, but it needs to get ready. So the second part of that is what we need to ask civic society and Westminster and the trade unions is about preparation. It can't just be a bolt from the blue. There'll be the mechanics of this when it happens. And the worry, the worry I have, you can put me right, is that somebody will then go, what did the, what, what, what's this about or whatever? And the blockages start appearing and obstacles. And the ground need to be prepared that that doesn't happen. So preparation is key having the conversation in a focused way and finally you know everybody here tonight uh the i just want to per personalize it right I, 
I, I was born in Derry in September 1970, giving my age away or whatever, can see retirement if such a thing still exists somewhere <laughs> in the, the next 10 years or whatever. But, you know, for people like me, live and work, and, you know, I have two teenagers, we're constantly told about this mythical choice, right, that we have. Think about everything that we have lived through in the past and in recent history, what has been done to us, what has been inflicted to us through this Brexit process. And I don't think it is actually too much to ask, could we exercise this mythical choice that the apparently the whole constitutional structure is based around and could we know what we're voting for? I've sort of made my mind up, right? I'll give it a minute, but, but people need to know what they're voting for. It needs to be done right and managed it well. So it's an amazing privilege to be involved in the conversation. It's agonizing, complicated legally and all that, yes, but at its heart, it's very, very simple. And it's about uh, choice and it's about joining that discussion. So thanks again, privilege to be here, but I hope this isn't a one-off. You know, and I want to be in many, many other discussions like this listening to it. So thank you. Thank, thanks very much. <laughs> I think if we had been having a debate about self-determination for, for Yorkshire, a lot of it would have been taken up by the question of what the capital city um, <laughs> would be. Um, we've been talking instead about the many questions for... Um, <clears throat> United Ireland and Irish Unity, and it's been stressed by a number of panelists, there is an enormous amount of work going on on the ground. We ourselves have done a number of reports. The most recent one was around sort of constitutional frameworks for, for women's rights and minority rights, minority covering linguistic minorities, Irish speakers, etc., migrants, um, and also a unionist minority, a British citizen minority, and a future United Ireland and equality of treatment, and, and trying to tease out what those frameworks would look like. And I think a lot of that can be done in academia and civil society. Um, but ultimately, it is going to take an official process, just like the Scottish Civil Service did. Um, the Irish Civil Service will have to produce a, a similar blueprint on many of the other technical issues, whether that's around pensions, which will be hotly debated, whether that's around um, having separate legal jurisdictions. All of these sort of things that you need a, a blueprint for will have to be uh, thrashed out. Um, Going back to legacy, and, and John, you're right, I think it was about 20 or 30 in the chamber as the legacy bill was rammed through the Commons. It um, was delayed a lot more in the, in the Lords. But I was struck by your comments from um, a gentleman from Guernica about linking a lot of these things, many of the patterns of human rights violations that are identified in this report in terms of torture and others are by no means unique um, to the north of Ireland. In fact, though we've never had a truth commission, Brazil did have a truth commission, and that's the only place where the use of the five techniques of torture um, in Belfast and other places is actually mentioned. It's in the Brazilian Truth Commission report. Why? Because at the same time, the Brazilian military regime um, was doing um, a training exercise with the British Army uh, in sharing what they called the English techniques or clean techniques. Um, of torture, uh, uh, and we know that the types of patterns of human rights violations that we are seeking accountability for in our jurisdiction did not start there, but we also know they did not stop there. Um, if you look at exactly the same types of, of uh, using the torture example techniques popping up in uh, the Iraq war and various other places, the importance of actually gaining accountability for guarantees of non recurrence <coughs> is so absolutely crucial. But <coughs> linking it to the legacy debate, I want to bring up the word reconciliation. Now, the legacy bill, the Tory legacy bill, has the word reconciliation in its title. Now, why, why is that? I mean, it's clearly not going to lead to reconciliation. Sure, all the people who it's supposed to recognize hate it and are opposed to it. How can it possibly lead to to reconciliation, and in much more legal language, that's actually pretty much what the, the High Court found um, when it examined the legislation, and particularly the amnesty. The reason why the word reconciliation was put in the title of the Legacy Act was to give a, an attempt, not a very good one, but an attempt at legal cover for the um, amnesty um, provisions, given as there's some tiny bit of case law that says you can maybe have an amnesty where it's necessary for, for reconciliation. But dealing with legacy issues in some sort of structure 
is so important for reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation on the basis of false historical narratives about what happened. Um, and if it's not dealt with, it's going to leave a very poisoned legacy um, that will leak into, into, into this debate uh, uh, and continue to be an, an, an intractable uh, problem. Should be. Uh, well, I don't know if Paul or somebody from the executive but I, I wants to comment, but I very much just uh, agree with what everybody said. I mean, I, I, I can't help feeling um, at times great despair uh, with the current state of affairs, you know, in this country and internationally, particularly around Gaza. And, you know, we've talked a lot about law tonight and and then you just you, you just know that this government doesn't really seem to care about basic international law, you know. And um, but I've got great optimism as well, um, and and a lot of that comes from the enormous amount of work that a very relatively small number of people uh, have been able to do so far, just to raise. Uh, Irish unity and I'm talking about this country now I'm obviously not talking about Ireland I live in Ireland um, I want to pay tribute to, to Nadine and Amanda um, Paul all the members Alana, all the members of Labour for Irish Unity Exec who really work Pierce over there who really work really hard to, to keep the issue alive I mean Paul can tell you of some of the awful meetings that they've attended with them, you know, shadow ministers, and they've had to sit patiently and deal with these people to just try and keep the issue alive. But I also get a great optimism from, you know, other people I hear, like, you know, people like Frank Lynn and others um, who, who in the Terence McSweeney Memorial Committee are, are out there bringing, raising Ireland in, in issues you know, on, on demonstrations around Gaza, you know, educating lots of people about the links between all these colonial struggles that have gone on for many centuries and the great wrongs that this country has done, you know. Um, so I kind of just want to move forward on a spirit of optimism and struggle, really. And uh, I love what our comrade uh, James said over there. He spoke very well in the Hammersmith Irish Centre yesterday um, as well. <laughs> but, um, no, the one thing I did want to say just very briefly was that any events that, that I've done in academic capacity around this future in Britain and in England, here, actually, so we've talked about indifference, but also another thing to notice, the overwhelming goodwill towards Ireland among many people yes. on this island yeah. who only yeah. wish Ireland well, yeah. that who will be dancing on the streets of London, right, in the rain if this happens, mm. who who see it as a hopeful thing, right, so are not just indifferent, but a number of people who've come up and said, no, like, we, we want this, how can we help? So it's definitely something to think about, that mobilising that enormous goodwill of the people here who want this to be happen, people here who are very much part, who are part of the Ireland, you know, the question of voting rights, the, 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 the notion of Irishness goes well beyond the Ireland of Ireland, you know, and this project will, will not be doable or possible if it's territorially confined, because what it means to be Irish is much, much larger than that. You know, it's a global project. You know, it's a hopeful project at a time we're in at the moment. We're going to have like, to Lily or, or, or Korea at the yeah. airline because we've got so many flights. <laughs> Don't go right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. We're, we're going to wrap yeah. up in a few minutes. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, really, yeah. my name is Frank Lane, yeah. chair of the Council of Training Committee. Now, my question might sound a bit radical, but how long do we wait for the British government or Hillary Clinton to make a decision? Sinn mm -hmm. Fein are in an extremely strong position, and this is to Darwin. Do you think the time will come when we're going to say to the British government, we're going to call a referendum? We're not going to wait for you to give us permission to have that referendum. Well, look, I don't envisage that. Um, but what I do see is is the political dial shifting on the island of Ireland to a degree whereby the, the voices calling 
for, as Colin eloquented, the choice to be made, not to impose anything, but to give people their say, uh, will be deafening. And I think there are stages that have moved that dial, you know, the Good Friday Agreement, obviously, in and of itself, uh, the peace process, the institutions being embedded in Michelle O'Neill's election as First Minister, the prospect of Sinn Féin leading government, and I'm being very partisan in saying that, of course, would move the dial considerably. And, and whilst the GFS states quite categorically that, yes, the British Secretary of State has the right to call, or sorry, the obligation to call a referendum when he or she determines that, that it could be lost from a unionist perspective, the reality of the situation is this will be a British government initiative. This won't be, as Colin said, the Secretary of State jumping out of bed one day saying, I'll, I'll throw the Irish a bone. That's not how this is going to happen. And pressure from Dublin, pressure from Brussels, pressure from Washington, all of those dynamics can work as well. That's why our commission events have been international and will continue to be. So I don't envisage a situation whereby we call a, a referendum. The Dublin government could, of course, have a referendum. They're obliged to hold a referendum under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement as well and state categorically that in the event of people in the North voting for unity, that the job is done already by way of uh, the consent of the people in the 26th. But again, those dynamics are probably not in the best interests of winning the thing in the long run. Uh, I think a, a Dublin government that's serious about unity, uh, when the institutions of the state, when academia, as we've just discussed, the trade union movement, businesses, all of those forces within a state start moving, uh, and they are in Ireland, by the way, uh, CBI or even in favor of, of uh, enhanced north-south collaboration and, and on financial issues. When all of those stars align, London will jump. That is inevitable. And, and for all of the posturing of the British Prime Minister or British Secretary of State, whoever he or she may be, uh, in relation to, I don't see it, it's not happening, kicking the can down the road, um, these people aren't. Um, aren't clueless to the reality of the political situation in Ireland. And I think progress in Dublin, while not hinging entirely on Sinn Féin leading the next government, us leading the next government would certainly uh, add an impetus to that. And we are serious, as are other parties in the 26th, about planning for, for unity and doing this well. And if Dublin eyeballs London, then, then we can see progress. Look, I'm rubbish at chair meetings. We're going to go on all night, aren't we? I'm going to say, stay here until two o'clock tomorrow. Usually, <laughs> we've done that before. Anyway, um, can I thank all the speakers? Can I thank all the organisers from uh, Labour for Irish Unity? Can I thank Jackie Connor as well, who does a lot of work for all, all of us in, in sort, sorting out these arrangements? And thanks for coming along. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.